like to ask is if uh, each of our panellists, just starting with Oliver and going along, if you could just really succinctly and briefly outline what the ideological position of your organisation is and if you claim not to have one, to um, at least give us a sense of what your bedrock values are that kind of underpin the work that you do. So, Oliver. I'm relieved to report that we have a philosophy. We are not left-wing or right-wing. We are classical liberal. We are not conservative either. And we are independent. We are the Center for Independent Studies. We're independent from government. We are not taking um, commissioned research. We are not a consultancy. And we're trying to apply classical liberal thinking to policy questions. Uh, we're progressive and pluralist, um, which means that we think that we should be working to make Australia fairer, more sustainable and more democratic while protecting basic human rights and freedoms. Uh, but we also have uh, some slightly more complex ideas, which is around making sure that we use the best policy tool for the job. So letting markets and governments and the community sector each play to their strengths and compensate for each other's weaknesses, and also respecting the complexity of human nature. So recognising that we're all individualistic and interdependent where selfish and altruistic at the same time. Right, the IPA is a free market think tank. We believe in free markets and a free society for economic reasons, but also for social and moral reasons. Uh, it's about unleashing the maximum potential of the individual. Per capita is a progressive think tank and uh, we're guided by three mutually reinforcing values. Um, we work around prosperity, around fairness and around communities. We try to apply those values um, using a rigorous economic toolkit and an underpinning of social justice. What's the Occupy Wall Street movement about? It's just a, a whole bunch of left-wing activists who um, normally complain about uh, cultural imperialism from the United States who are just quite happy to cookie-cutter copy uh, that sort of activity, which is basically uh, about a whole series of discontents about lots of different issues, some of which I agree with and some of which I don't, but I don't think it really has much to do with uh, a backlash against libertarian ideals. Because um, when it comes down to it, it's a handful of people. Oh, one thing that might contest that idea that young people are more likely to be uh, well, libertarian or free marketeers uh, is just that more young people grow, vote Greens than uh, any other generation. And you would regard the Greens as being probably the least of the least purest free market of any of the parties, although I think they probably have one of the more free market positions on climate change of the... Well, no, they don't have a free market <laughs> position on climate change at all, but that's a Compared secondary... Compared to the coalition, issue. they do. Well, no, they, no they, have a, they have what... A, no, they have a market-based solution. Market-based and free market are not the same thing. Um, and certainly, yes, a lot of young people do vote Greens, but I do actually still stand by my position. They are, there is actually identified value sets, and there are places where the Greens have a more libertarian position on some policy issues than the alternatives. I'd argue that maybe young people are more likely, and I haven't really got any evidence for this, so you can talk about evidence-free ideas, um, I, but I suspect based on experience, young people are more likely to be less ideological than any other generation because we're kind of living in a situation where people are much more likely to be making their decisions on a case-by-case -case basis based on values, and I think you really see that in, in organisations like GetUp where there's not really an over uh, overarching coherent ideology. There's a set of basic progressive values values and then you make your mind up on, on the policy issue of the day. There's, there's no doubt the free market has been the most powerful idea in global politics in the last 40, 50 years. I don't think you can really dispute that if you see the changes that have, that have taken place in Europe and North America. But the free market hit a big wall in September 2008. Um, we had pursued a set of policies, particularly around financial markets, that were all around deregulation and laissez-faire. And in the... Yes, no, or we can talk about this in the Q&A. No. <laughs> How long have you got? Oh, we, can, we can do it as long as you like. Okay. So, in two, September 2008, we, we started to see this unravel. And the response to it is very uh, ill-informed and inchoate, and you see that in the Occupy movement. I don't think yet there is any kind of well-formed thinking as to how we adapt um, from the situation we're in. Clearly, the, the, the global economic crisis is going to roll for some time. Um, and young people... Uh, are watching this thinking, gee, we, we felt we had a fairly stable um, equilibrium in which free markets were the dominant idea. The world looks very different now. How do we respond to that? Oliver, do you want to briefly? Well, <clears throat> I'm not surprised at all that uh, young people are more likely to vote Greens because young people are always tending to the left. I mean, it's been like this for, I think, at least 50 or 60 years. There is a saying, of course, that if you're growing up and you're young and you're not a lefty, you have no heart. But if you're then growing up and older and you're not turning into a right-winger, then you have no brains. Now, with all due respect, 
I'm not, I'm not saying that you either need to grow up or you don't have any brains, but um, I, I think that seems to be a normal progression. I can still remember telling you a secret now. I once voted Social Democrat. <laughs> So I, I just turned 32. When, when is the point where I switched I'm over 36. to the CIS? <laughs> okay, I have one more quick ideology question. So this is for Miriam and David. So what is progressive in Australia? What's a progressive policy and what is a progressive ideology? Look, I, I think that the reason that you hear people talking about progressive more than they talk about left these days is that the left was very strongly identified with a socialist worldview, and obviously, uh, you know, at its extreme end, um, that was really associated with the idea that you could um, let the say, state solve all your problems, right? And uh, these days, I think that, um, you know, we've hit the equivalent um, on the right or on the, the sort of free marketeer side uh, of the Berlin Wall moment for the left, where we were sort of fa fa forced to deal with the realities of what that looked like in practice, what too much state power looked like in practice. And since then, we've had to have a much more complex worldview and embody those kind of basic principles of social justice and fairness in a more complex set of policies. And I think that um, the free marketeers, the purest free marketeers, uh, basically the GFC has been their Ber Berlin Wall moment. And yes, you will. I heard some people in the audience. Um, you will still have the people who say, oh, well, you know, the real problem with the global financial crisis was that it wasn't free market enough. But that's a little bit like, you know, communists saying, oh, well, the real problem was that communism was never fully implemented in theory. Okay, it's just absolute <laughs> rubbish. I'm sorry. I just won't accept this. This is just rubbish. I mean, at the end of the day, the GFC, at the heart of it came from bad government debts injected into the economy. And the free market did exactly what it should have done, repackaged them and handed them off and said, get should, them away from us. Should we do this one now? Do you want to do the possible. GFC one now? This is I'm, just I'm, crap. I'm happy to answer the and progressive I'm tired question. Of hearing it. I'm Isn't happy to answer the progressive first, question. And then yeah, go, go on. Tell progressive, us very, progressive very simply is about positive social and economic change. And its counterpoint is not libertarian or not free market. Its counterpoint is really conservative. And, and to me, you can see kind of in, in the word itself, that's about conserving the status quo. And, you know, this is just a, a different view on kind of the ability of societies to evolve and to improve and to get better versus, you know, taking the status quo and seeking to maintain it. Maybe I'm just a bit confused here, but um, I think what you're trying to do is you're trying to get away from the old labels. You don't want to be a social democrat anymore, you don't want to be a socialist anymore, and so you're calling yourself progressive. Now, I think that doesn't quite uh, capture it, um, because I think, I mean, what does it mean if, you're, if you two are progressives? Does that mean that I'm a Stein, Steinzeit Neanderthal? Uh, <laughs> um, or am I regressive? Uh, am I hardly alive anymore? <laughs> I don't know. Um, now you've, I told actually, us, you've told us very clearly, Oliver, you're, you're independent and libertarian. I'm happy to accept that. Perfect. But I'm progressive as well, because I want progress. Yeah, and, and, just to make, and just to make things even more complicated, I actually think that there's value in both the progressive and conservative traditions. So, so we're kind of talking about multiple potential ways of slicing up the ideological cake here, right? You know, there's the people who take their inspiration from the future rather than the past. And I'm sure that there are people that you could call both left and right. And I'm happy to take the left label, um, you know, I, if, if, if it's a choice between left I, and I right. Just, I just find um, it very difficult, actually, I, because uh, David and I, we often appear together on radio, and he's always introduced as the guy from the progressive think tank and that sounds all very positive, and that come, I, and uh, it's always from that libertarian think tank. You and can it's always yourself whatever you like. <laughs> progressive. But, but, but progressive <laughs> is complete rubbish. I'm sorry. It has no intellectual <laughs> basis whatsoever. Um, it's about the idea that we can create a fairer society. We all believe in a fairer society, but define fair. It's a grab bag of things based on what you think matters at any given time. You look at the world as though it's a dashboard of dials that can be tweaked to come up with a more perfect equilibrium. It's crap. <laughs> okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on <laughs> for one moment. So, um, I'd like to touch on the evidence issue. So, think tanks claim to be empiricists, that you use evidence to show you and come up with, you know, the most appropriate or best or truest policy conclusions. Um, and we all seem to be using the same data sets, but coming up with very different answers about the same issues using the same data. So, if everyone's an empiricist, what is going on? I, I think... That's a slight uh, kind of misperception of, of what think tanks are about. Think tanks have to be grounded in values, as Correct. we've just talked about. And, you know, there are, there are other think tanks in Australia that claim to be kind of values-free or values-neutral and, and to deal solely with data. But I don't think they're the kind of think tanks that, that generate, you know, long-term political, economic, social change. And so I think all of us here would agree, I suspect, that, you know, you start with the values and, and you, you kind and of work through the... Data. Well, but the, the, David's absolutely right on this. Public policy is ultimately about politics and it's about values. 
Um, and values don't just inform what you see the solution to a challenge is. It also informs what you see as a challenge in the first place. Public policy isn't like scientific research where you do a set of data and then you come out with an outcome and that's the conclusion. Public policy is shaped by values from the outset and you can find evidence to back up your argument no matter how well, the way you want to look at different issues. And that's, that's why we get this divergence. Yeah, I would agree that the reason that we're coming up with different conclusions is probably because we're testing different hypotheses and Correct. the hypotheses that we want to test are shaped by our values. Okay. I, I can only agree, which is frightening. <laughs> right. but Good. Excellent. <laughs> we found the consensus we'd, on we'd, the panel we'd already. We'd probably all, though, all be equally critical of the uh, amount of evidence, less policy that goes on at, um, yeah. at the government level. So, I mean, this yeah. is what so David's absolutely right. The, the Grattan Institute is a farce when it comes down to it. I'm sorry, they <laughs> think you can have values-free public policy. So what issues are you going to think that matters? Oh, funnily enough, they're all the government's one. Um, it, it, and what, they're going to come up with solutions. They just go through data and they decide which data is in or out. That's called an editorial decision. Values are behind that. You cannot have values-free policy. OK, all right. Well, here's something I think you might disagree about. Um, so the CPD, so the Centre for Policy Development, released a book... Um, last year, which was a really broad range of ideas for policy solutions from school funding to healthcare to cultural policy. And one of the ideas that was particularly interesting was a, an article by Phil Lynch, um, and it was about an Equality Act. And it's a, piece of a suggestion for a piece of legislation that creates a legal right to substantive equality and a duty to prevent rather than address discrimination. So, Miriam, how does that play out in society? How would that look? Look, I, I think the inspiration for Phil Lynch writing about that was the harmonisation of anti-discrimination laws that's going on at the federal level at the moment. It's sort of part of, part of the government's seamless economy, you know, let's harmonise all of these different pieces of legislation agenda. And I, I think that he saw that as an opportunity to, one, fill in some of the gaps in anti-discrimination legislation. So at the moment, um, you know, for, we've got different bits of anti-discrimination legislation. None of them cover discrimination against people on the basis of sexual identity or sexual orientation, you know, so that's a big gap there, obviously. Um, and, and I think that they're arguing for that to have some of the gaps filled in, but possibly also beefed up at the same time. So he, I think, was drawing on inspiration from models like they have, I think, in the UK, also in South Africa, where there is some push, uh, some shift towards not just um, looking at, you know, uh, a, a sort of taught basis of saying, OK, you've clearly discriminated against this person here, but actually also looking at the sort of more systemic and inbuilt um, discrimination that might exist within organisations. So what are you actually doing to prevent discrimination? So creating a positive right. It, did you want to...? I was just going to say, the, re the real challenge with the equality question is equality of what? Um, and, you know, you're talking about equality of income, equality of wealth, equality of access. Um, you know, the one I'm most comfortable with is equality of opportunity. Um, but then, you know, there are judgments around how institutional structures enable equality of opportunity. So, you know, equality often gets used with a full stop at the end without the equality of what? And, I, you know, you really got to unpick that to, to make the question meaningful, I reckon. Yeah, and I, I definitely think equality of opportunity is probably the most important thing, and I think we're probably quite far from that in Australia, actually, at the moment. Um, you just need to look at the way our education system at the primary and secondary level is playing out. We have very strong correlation between what kind of education kids are getting and what their social and economic background is. So that's... So that's, that's, I think, quite far from equality of opportunity. I do think equality of outcomes, uh, inequality of outcomes matters. Now, obviously, actually aiming for equality of outcomes is not feasible or desirable. You know, you've got to have some uh, ability for things to stretch out. But com just allowing equality of out inequality of outcome to grow without any sort of checks on that has problems. And I think that's what we're seeing in the US at the moment, right? Once you get inequality to a certain level, you know, concentrated wealth and power turns into more concentrated wealth and power unless you actually take active steps to rein it in. I think we need to do that. It has costs. It has costs at the top as well as at the bottom. It, it undermines trust. It undermines people's faith that equality of opportunity does actually exist. I have no particular comment on what Miriam was just saying. I mean, everybody, I think, in broad principle agrees that people should have equality of opportunity 
uh, particularly for those who are vulnerable, so particularly for children. But at some point, we have to actually put um, something called individual responsibility back onto people's lives. And I see consistently uh, equal opportunities of justification to erode the concept of responsibility and for people to take responsibility for their lives. And, um, so I'm not a, a big fan of the, the movement. I'm not a big fan either because I think uh, freedom of contract is a, a valuable thing in society and we all discriminate on a daily basis. I discriminated uh, against a number of occasions tonight bec because I wanted to be here, so I have to make decisions, I have to discriminate. And the same should be true in all other markets too, in the employment market, in, uh, in product markets. I think we have to discriminate, we have to keep freedom of contract alive because otherwise it's a meaningless concept. And when we're talking about equality, I mean, I've seen equality at work and it looked very grey and everybody was driving a Trabant and it was called East Germany. <laughs> but it's, can I just say, I... I there's a distinction though, isn't yeah. there, between saying we should make everybody be the same and saying we should just let inequality grow to whatever level and we don't really care about that. But right? really, I, I think you can't legislate for that. And um, I mean, it's nice to have these you examples. You can. It's called Hang progressive on. taxation. You know, yes, it's called. Um, <laughs> if you let me finish, um, I mean, Is that you, what of course, it's, it's also it's also worth saying that inequality, in my view at least, is a bad. Um, yeah, excess inequality is a bad. So if you've got, you know, excess inequality of, of wealth of income. It's correlated with you know all kinds of negative social economic outcomes, life expectancy, morbidity, health, and the like. So governments can act to. Um, minimise inequality, as Miriam says, progressive taxation, things like that. And, not, you know, I think there's a, there's a legitimate role there for that to take place. But, but even then, if you're accepting the idea of equality, it's how you actually go about achieving that. I mean, I want a fair society, but what I define as fair is a very, uh, very probably very different from what you believe is fair, Mir uh, Miriam or, or David. Um, but, and... By the way, fairness is achieved by the free market. Uh, there's a, uh, just throw that out there. Uh, because? But, just because but, but even then, no, no. Because you're even saying then, that no. free market is, it equates to equality of opportunity? It, 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 it creates an environment where everybody can have their individual potential unleashed and they can pursue their own interests to the better interests of society. But even then, taking it back, if you talk about something like equality, which is a very broad concept, how you try and address particular types of issues with regards to social or economic inequality can be addressed by the heavy hand of the state or it can be addressed in part through charitable organisations and civil society institutions uh, which actually make sure that people are taken care of in a radically different way and which actually normally, in my view, build very much better outcomes. So uh, you, it, there is, within the free market system, um, mechanisms to address issues around inequality and access and opportunity. Okay, so on markets, sorry, I'm just going to skip ahead. Um, <coughs> Last year, in a memo to the then new Prime Minister, per capita advised the government to restart the productivity reform agenda using market design to rule out market failures, particularly in health, education, energy and superannuation. David, can you explain how market design is different to what we have now? So, for us at per capita, market design is, is, is government setting the rules of the game. Um, I think we'd, our starting point would be that the theoretical pure free market does not exist. You know, there are, there are market failures all across the place, be they externalities, be they market power, what have you. Sure, no, absolutely. Happy to, happy to concede that. That was government up. failure for the people on television. <laughs> Go government failure, absolutely. Um, so, you know, there, there are some markets that work very well with, with minimal government interference. Um, you know, the economist John Kay writes about the market for bread in New York, and he says, how is it that, you know, this city of 12, 14 million people gets serviced, you know, every corner, every morning, every different kind of bread? any different price variable. And that, that works very well. Um, you get uh, the instance of carbon emissions, you've got there a large market failure. You've got a negative externality that's not priced. So governments create markets in that instance for something that doesn't previously exist in the way they've done for employment services, for mobile phone spectrum, in Australia for water. And the design task there is not a, is not a straightforward one. So you've got to think very carefully about how you incentivise the different actors uh, in a way that limits market failure, promotes competition and, and gets you the best social outcomes. And, and that depends on what your kind of starting value set is. I'm getting a bit irritated when I hear the word market failure because I'm not, never quite sure what you mean. Market failure in economic theory has a very clear meaning and it means uh, that a market simply doesn't equate. It doesn't come together. But what you mean when you say market failure is something completely different. What you, uh, mean, by market, on, market, what failure, what you mean by market failure is when the market doesn't produce the result that you want to see. Correct. And that's a different story. No, that's true. That's not true. It, it, market failure is when competition is inhibited. And, and the key thing that gets left out of this story is competition, right? So 
Where do, do you've you know got... the biggest problem with competition is government failure that makes it harder for new people to enter into the market so that they can go and compete? But that's, that's not where the story around market failure is in Australia. I'm talking particularly around market power here. So you have, you know, organisations, be they... In, be yeah, they like in... the National Broadband Network. <laughs> <laughs> Well, OK, so, OK, I, I let's take, let's take the National Broadband Network. Very good example. So you had Telstra, which is a, a network monopoly, um, and in my view, the sensible thing to do with Telstra 10 years ago would have been to separate the retail part on which you can trade content from the network part, which is a natural monopoly, and leave that in public ownership. Instead, what we did was privatise the whole thing, and now we're kind of back solving the problem, building a publicly owned network on which others will be able to kind of trade content. And, and you know, you get a very good example there of, of the potential where you get... Um, competition to, to thrive on the, on the content side, but the economics of a network monopoly make it very hard for competition to work. You, you, you get a producer surplus. Uh, uh, look, I'm not an economist, Oliver, but I thought that your definition of market failure in standard econ textbook economics was a little narrow there. I mean, you know, no, it's the, the it network is. economics, it's the asymmetric information, it's the public goods... It's the unpriced <laughs> negative externalities. No, that's exactly it's it's a rubbish uh, progressive <laughs> definition that's it's actually not. been developed over time. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. You're arguing <laughs> with <laughs> half the economics profession there. I think no, no, actually no, no. more than half. No, well, uh, no, I'm quite happy to argue with them. You, what most progressive talk about, progressives, talk about when they, uh, they refer to market failure, it's undesirable outcomes or outcomes that you don't like. That's all it's about. That's, it's, so it's, what it's, would you say about public goods negative externalities you know, uh, natural monopolies. Do you have a view on how Sorry? how well the market deals with them? Even, I, I think in, the, even in the neoclassical microeconomic theory, those things do not give you the optimal outcome. But your, your, your definition, the way you've used market failure this evening, is quite crystal clear. It is, you do not like the outcome, therefore the market has failed. It's, that is not true. It's not that I don't like the outcome. This, this is a kind of theoretical right. construct. It doesn't okay, hold up to what you value. This is circular. Let's yeah, switch okay. to something Good that we'll really agree on, taxation. Um, so, per capita have carried out a series of surveys canvassing Australian attitudes towards taxation and this year one of the findings in the survey was that Australians believe we are, we are a high taxing big government country. Now David, you've been debunking some of this and arguing that Australia isn't so much a nanny state. Um, why do you think our perceptions are so wrong here? I, I think we should separate for a moment the taxation and the nanny state thing. I'm happy to come back to nanny state. But on tax... Um, you know, you, you can go to the data. The OECD collects data on, on all of the 32 members or whatever it is, and we're in the bottom 20% of tax to GDP. So, you know... And the others are broke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the others are broke. Some of the well, others the are broke, but the ones that have... The, no, just there. interestingly on that, the ones that have the highest tax to GDP ratios in Northern Europe are not broke. Yeah. They're, 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 well, it's a fact. <laughs> so, what you know, what we're trying to talk about there is our public argument, our public debate around tax. Now, my colleagues um, from CIS and IPA would have it that tax is generally a bad. Tax is treated in the main, in that dialogue, as, as, as government theft. We reckon tax is an investment in a, in a future, prosperous, cohesive society. So you're saying I don't invest enough? <laughs> I, th I, th I think Australia runs the risk of not investing enough. You know, you see the infrastructure bottlenecks that we've had over the last five, seven years, which have crimped growth, particularly before the GFC. That's a failure to invest in our national hard and soft infrastructure. Government and failure. again, well... But, but, <laughs> but, but the thing is, the private sector finds it very difficult you, to invest in that stuff because the returns are shared. D David, do you see a very strong correlation with the constant scope and increase in the size of government where they seem to think that they can do anything and at the same time the failure to actually do the basic things where there actually isn't a radical debate so, so about things successfully and well? Like what? Well, you just talked about infrastructure. I'm not, I'm not in favour of government delivering all types of infrastructure, of course, but there are some types of infrastructure that government can facilitate and make successful, and those are the things where we're failing while we're constantly expanding government out into other areas. So I think one of the things you're, you're going to here, Tim, is, is some of the bad growth in government. You know, I think middle-class welfare is something that we, you know, all of us bad. on the panel here have talked about. It's bad growth in government. You know, there are bad taxes as well as good taxes, and I'm, I'm not here for a moment to say that all tax in every form is good. You know, why do we still have stamp duty? Why do we still have state payroll taxes? I mean, these are inefficient taxes, and, you know, we should get rid of them. Arguably, we should broaden our consumption tax, because, you know, consumption is not mobile, and capital and labour are. Um, so I'm not for a moment saying that all tax is good, but I'm saying we want to raise enough tax to be able to invest in the public goods and services that the private sector finds it very hard to deliver and that generate prosperity for the country. Can I just throw in there then? So the Centre for Policy Development um, 
did, have released a research paper tracking the size and role of the Australian public service. And in that paper it found that Australians favour a strong role for government in society and the economy and that they're willing to pay higher taxes for it, which is actually quite different to what your survey said. So here we go, empiricism going around in circles again. But um, I guess my question is, if Australians feel that we do, we, we do want more government, then why are we still outsourcing? What's happened to the debate there? Miriam. Look, specifically what Australians are willing to pay more tax for is more spending on health and education. So that is a, a contingent willingness to pay more tax, right? Um, but however, look, I, I think that, um, and this is something that Terry, Terry Moran acknowledged in the big review of, um, of the public service that, that happened recently, was that actually that trend towards outsourcing and privatisation had ha happened generally against public opinion against the sway of public opinion. You only have to see the amount of public opposition to specific instances of privatisation to see that. Um, so it, it happened on the basis of ideology, actually. It happened on the basis of, you know, the increasing belief, um, you know, with, within the public sector itself um, and, you know, very effectively promoted by organisations like the CIS and IPA that, you know, if in doubt, leave it to the market, if in doubt, outsource and sell it off. Um, and, you know, I think that that's what that kind of consensus, um, you know, within Treasury uh, and, and I think within the Australian media as well is something that has really driven that kind of behaviour. Personally, I think that, you know, you have to recognise that no, no matter who pays for services, they still cost something. No matter who pays for infrastructure, it still costs money. That means that you actually have to make the decision about who should be delivering those services, who should be paying those services on the basis of pretty textbook economics, which I would argue includes the economics of public goods and other types of market failure and natural monopolies, um, and also on the basis of social values. And I would argue that that's actually a separate call from the, the textbook economics call. Oliver, do you have... I have a bit of a problem with these surveys because I don't quite trust them. Because whenever you ask people whether they think that climate change is something that needs to be addressed, they say, yeah, of course, sure. And then you ask them, uh, do you want to pay a carbon tax? And say, no, mm, probably not. <laughs> And you get the same question um, on, on road uh, charging, for example. I remember there were surveys in Britain when I worked there um, that people said that uh, more investment needs to be made into public transport and transport generally, and then you ask them whether they supported road pricing, and of course they said no. And the same problem here, I think, in the Australian tax service, whenever you ask people whether government should collect a bit more so they could spend it on education and health and all the good things we can all agree on, uh, they say, yeah, sure, that should be done. And then you ask them, do you want to pay more taxes? And they say, no, other people should. <laughs> and I think uh, it's that kind of um, wash me but don't wet me attitude. Yeah, yeah. So um, I don't trust surveys when you ask taxpayers whether they want to pay more taxes or whether other people should pay more taxes. Of course the others should pay more taxes. <laughs> I'll just throw to David, who's... Yeah, I mean, Oliver makes a good point. We, in fact, asked both the questions in our survey and in, in our presentation of the findings, we point to this cognitive dissonance whereby... People say one thing when they're talking about the collective, so yes, we want progressive taxation and better services and more government spending on health and education. But when you ask them about them, they're very clear in the main that I don't want to pay more tax. And it comes back to a perception about their relative wealth. So, you know, most people think they're battlers, whether they're on 150, 200, 250, 300, we correlate income with dollars. these... Dollars. Yeah. Thousand dollars. Thousand dollars. <laughs> Um, we correlate income with these responses. Uh, you know, people who are on any objective level very wealthy feel that they're doing it hard and, and, and don't Apparently want to pay more Apparently in Australia you can still feel extremely poor and welfare needy on 150000 a year. <laughs> Miriam? Uh, just two quick points. One is that we, um, one of the things that we drew on there was a Glenn Withers study which actually asked people... Uh, whether they'd be willing to pay more tax, but then also showed them what it would mean for their individual tax bill, and the willingness to pay went down a bit when you showed them what it meant on their individual tax bill, but it was still there. Um, and the other thing is that over time, uh, there's a quite long-running survey that asks Australians whether they would be willing to pay, whether they want tax cuts or they want more spending on social services, and those lines crossed over quite recently. So, yes, the... Um, the, yes, you know, people's answers may be, you know, affected by whether they think that they're going to be paying personally, but the trend line, I think, is significant there. Okay. So, Tim, I'd like to ask you, um, you've been writing quite widely about Australia's nanny state tendencies, like plain packaging of tobacco, and in a recent report with Julie Novak, um, you were arguing that just because a few people have a gambling problem, it doesn't really justify regulating the entire industry. Um, can you explain... What harm, further than, uh, what harm further regulation on gambling will have other than this sort of potentous sounding slippery slope to the nanny state? What will it actually do to people? 
Well, the reason I oppose many of these measures, almost all of them, is because I think they're fundamentally immoral. Um, they actually create a society where people are treated as victims and it creates a society where people are encouraged not to take responsibility and recognise that they are at the centre of their issues. And, you know, if you take something like mandatory pre-commitment, I mean, firstly, I don't actually think it will work um, because it's like saying to a chocoholic, just limit yourself to 10 blocks of Cadbury's uh, finest that day. It won't actually stop and cha radically change people's behaviour. Uh, but it actually sends this message that you're a victim. You can't make choices uh, and inform choices about how you live their lives. And that does have, uh, in addition to the slippery slope argument, it has uh, its own type of slippery slope where uh, if people constantly feel like they, they are the victims, responsibility is pushed on to somebody else. Uh, and it's just simply not true. I mean, these people may have issues, but they have to accept responsibility if they want to change their way of life and if they want to improve it. That's just, as simple as that. Just a question for you, Tim, on the mandatory pre-commitment stuff. Isn't the point that you do have a choice? Isn't the point that you can put any number in when you sit down at the poker machine and, and you, have, you have the ability to decide how much you want yeah, yeah. to lose? Well, that makes it but but the, first well, of that why makes does it make... No, because the point is it's, a, it's an environment that's designed to get, get a response, a kind of biological, neurological response. It's dark. You're in there. You're kind of tapping away. If you sit down at the beginning, you don't find that you've well, lost... You know the other reason why... I mean, I, I, I do take your point. Yes, there is still some level of choice. I don't dispute that, though I still oppose the regulation. Firstly, because once it's introduced, I'm not actually convinced it's going to stop there because what we've seen in all of these areas of policy is uh, this one's introduced and then we just go to the next one and the next one and the next one. There's a very strong correlation between the different types of measures. That, do you really think Nick but Xenophon and, and Andrew Wilkie at the end of the introduction of mandatory pre-commitment is going to turn around and say, oh, we're done now, we're fine, don't worry but about it. But the, so the logical extension of your argument is that we've got some kind of creeping authoritarian state in Australia we do. where the government is... We do! I mean, do you, does anybody <laughs> really believe that? Absolutely! <laughs> How about... You are patriots, have a, have everyone. Have a think for a moment about North Korea or Oliver's East Germany. Before. I mean... Yeah, ex exactly. I mean, Australia is a remarkably free country. Yes, and we want to keep it that way. Absolutely. And, and how Before we on turn earth into a Tea can, Party rally, can the choice, let's just how, keep it how together. How on earth can the choice to decide beforehand how much you're willing to lose... People do that with money, how much so they've got in their can, wallet. Can I just say, the, this policy came out of the Productivity Commission, which, so? which last time I they checked was, was not a particularly, uh, you know, nanny state favouring organisation. <laughs> um, <laughs> OK, let's, let's keep skimming along. So, a per capita research paper by Jack Fuller argued that the biggest policy challenges stem from our poor choices in, as individuals. So, this is gambling, diet, violence, drugs, debt those sorts of things. Um, and he was wondering about the role of government. And David, I was just wondering, can you explain where you think it's legitimate for the government to step in and where it's not? In 15 seconds or less. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I think the role of the, the state here is to enable people to make better choices. Now, what you have to take a view on is what choices are better. And that's a, that's a legitimate um, issue that's open for debate. But take something like organ donation. The... Uh, participation rate in an organ donation scheme is almost entirely conditional on whether it's an opt-in or an opt-out scheme. So in countries that have opt-out schemes, you have exceedingly high rates of organ donation. In those with opt-in schemes, very, very low rates. For countries as similar as Germany and Austria. But by high rates, they don't, they don't meet demand. Well, Which, they maybe there should be a free market in organs. Well, I think... You know, th no, th th this is discussed in, in the US and it's not the silliest idea I've ever heard in terms of a, you know, people who are willing um, to provide kidneys, for example. Th there's, a, there's a great unmet kidney need out there and people die from, from um, lack of healthy kidney organs. So, you know, that, that's an interesting bit at the kind of at the fringe of this debate. But more broadly, there are a set of kind of... It's called choice architecture in the kind of technical lingo. The thing, for example, do you, um, do you take a default choice in your super policy um, or uh, are you, can you take the default low fee, very simple choice or do you take a, a kind of more complex choice based on a 70 page PDF um, and, and the way these choices are structured affects social outcomes in quite a fundamental way and that's what the, that's what the paper's about, a lot more than 15 seconds I realise. Can I just point out that businesses take advantage of um, some basic neurological information about how our brains work all the time, right? You know, the, the, the opt-out default 
kind of mechanism. You know, it's it's there all over the place when the box is pre-ticked when you're trying to, you know, sign up for now some new service and they say pre-tick the box that says, oh, well, you're going to get our advertising as well. Um, you know, it, the anchoring bias uh, is a classic sales technique, right? You will name, name you a really high number for the start and then, you know, you're more likely to accept a slightly lower number but your brain will, you know, look at that high number and anchor on it. So I, I'm kind of confused about why there's so much libertarian outrage against um, the so-called nanny state like the choice architecture type options and, and no outrage against the nanny corporation. I think it matters um, how you design that scheme for organ donations, for example. We all know that we have waiting lists for organs, we have waiting lists for kidneys, for hearts, and so on. I think an easy way to deal with that would actually be to have a system where you pre-commit to, to donate your organs, and that would give you a higher <coughs> place on that list should you need one yourself. I think that's a nice idea. Yeah, that's, and being, that's being tried in Israel at the moment. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's the kind of uh, approach you can take to organizing these markets. The problem I have with the nanny state is not so much when I think of problem gamblers. I, know, I think we, we can all agree that there are people in society who are vulnerable. And I happen to work um, in a, an institution for mentally uh, disabled people when I um, didn't join the German army, but I did something useful. <laughs> and. Um, I, I've met these people, and I've met people who can't make their own decisions, and we have to protect them. And uh, there is no pure ideological libertarian solution to that, and I, I'm happy to admit that. What I have a problem with, though, is uh, that we treat the whole rest of society, the other 99%, as if they're pathologically stupid to make their own decisions. <laughs> Quite right. Can I just take a, actually a point that Miriam just said, that apparently companies that engage in ticking boxes uh, on your behalf when you voluntarily entered into it uh, is somehow a nanny state by business. There is a fundamental difference between government and business. One is voluntary and one isn't in terms of your engagement. They're not even remotely related and I think it's no, an absurd a proposition. You're a citizen of a state. In as That's much right. And you, and you are, but you know, I don't get to have this choice about whether I pay tax or not, but I do get the choice about whether I use a particular website or not and whether I choose to engage with it. They're entirely radically different concepts and I think there's been this massive under, uh, under understanding of um, by the Australian people uh, and this has been pushed of course by progressives, progressives uh, as well is uh, that business and government are the same. They're not the same at all. One of them is a voluntary institution, one of them is something you have to adhere to by, uh, basically compelled to adhere by. On the other hand, you know, I could move to a, to a different country if I decided I didn't like the tax regime in my country. I find it very difficult to leave Facebook. Uh, well, that's your choice, though. Oh. But can, I, can, I, can I just add on top of that? Why not nationalise Facebook? <laughs> <laughs> can I just say on that, Miriam, though, that is the classic argument of why we need competitive federalism and, get more, and uh, push more onus back onto states rather than having everything put at the national level because when you have competitive federalism, you give people choice. They can move to different states if they don't like the laws. If they do have a different att attitude culturally uh, to the way the government is running, it is an entirely desirable outcome. Laws are better best designed to those closest they affect. So, speaking but, but of moving to different states... Sorry, okay. too slow. Um, Oliver, in a recent report, you argued that Australia has succeeded in, in, its multi, in multiculturalism in integrating immigrants because it selects, it's very highly selective in choosing ambitious and qualified migrants who are eager to integrate into Australia. What I'd like to... Well, feel free to um, extend your argument, if you like, but what I'd really like to ask is, the panel, do you agree with this immigrant meritocracy? And then how do you feel about refugees? Uh, yeah, of course. I mean, it works here. You get uh, extremely well-qualified German economists entering the country. <laughs> <laughs> Although I'm here on a family visa. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, what really triggered it, we had a big debate in Europe in recent years over the failure of multiculturalism. And uh, I think there is good evidence, statistical evidence, to back that claim up that multiculturalism in Europe is failing. Because if you look at, for example, unemployment rates of migrants in, in, in Germany or in, in France or in Britain, you can see that they are usually higher than that of the native-born population. You can also see that they, are, they tend to be more welfare dependent. You can see that uh, migrants' children, for example, in Germany, um, lag behind uh, German children by about t two years, in, on average, in school testings. And then you look at Australia and you see that basically all these problems don't exist here. Because our migrants, on average, do better in the labor market. They are less welfare dependent and their children do better at school. So there must be some reason for that. Now, some people say Australia is a very welcoming country. And yep, that's probably true. 
some say it's probably doing something better on immigration and integration policy. And I think that's not quite so true because when you look at the integration programs of Australian governments, they're doing exactly the same what the Europeans are doing. So where is the difference? And I think the difference really is that Australia has a point system. It's really trying to select these migrants extremely carefully and you know how it works. They have to speak English, they have to bring qualifications to Australia. And then what this means in effect is you're bringing in middle class people who are educated. But you take the same middle class people educated and put them into any other country and they become good Chileans or good Polish or good Germans or good British. It doesn't matter because they almost integrate themselves. Whereas European countries in the past have not had that point system, so they took whoever came. And of course these people have different problems. So I think one of the reasons why Australian multiculturalism works so well is because these people have basically integrated themselves. It's not because we did some great integration programs for them. It's just because we took the right people who fit in and who have the potential to make a difference in Australia and to really become successful people and successful migrants in this country. And I think this is where Australian multiculturalism and European multiculturalism are completely different. I might just jump straight to the refugee question. Um, an argument that... I'm not talking about refugees, by the way. Yeah. There's a completely well, different category. But I, I just kind of want to connect it with that because um, John Menadju, who co-founded the Centre for Policy Development, um, always makes an argument that I think is quite compelling that refugees also make some of the best uh, citizens, um, that there's so much... Uh, it, there's, there's so much evidence that Australia has benefited incredibly from the... Um, you know, Vietnamese refugees who came here in the 70s, that, um, that you tend to find that refugees tend to be very enterprising, um, you know, like they've taken that initiative to get themselves out of the situation they were in rather than sitting there and putting up with it. They'll be active citizens. Um, and I would actually argue on that basis and, and we should increase the proportion of refugees in that's the immigration That's all wonderful. The, the problem with refugees is when refugees do not try to make a difference, when they don't try to enter the labour market, but when they go straight into the welfare state. Correct. <laughs> I think that was, that was what the Malaysia solution was about, wasn't it? <laughs> well, look, I broadly agree with both of those points. I think, you know, Australia clearly has a, a, an excess demand for the, the number of people who want to come here, and I think um, we should have a, a strong uh, refugee program, a strong family program, but for the, for the remainder, we should be you know, selecting people who have skills and, and language capability and, and a kind of demonstrate a drive to come here. I also agree with Miriam that, gee, if someone has the kind of chutzpah and wherewithal to get themselves from Sri Lanka or Afghanistan to here and we can prove they're genuine asylum seekers and not lock them up for two years, they are likely to make a, a very valuable contribution to our economy and so our society. I've got time for one more and then it's everybody else's turn. And of the various issues it would have been awesome to cover, uh, Oliver's crazy red tape pollution scheme, media ownership, uh, the EU debt crisis, protectionism and the nanny state. Do you have a preference? Yes, red tape trading. <laughs> red tape. <red> ta <laughs> I was going to say protectionism, but... Oh. Very quickly, red tape. So, Oliver, what was your very quick summary of your funny idea? Look, um, we all know that we should uh, cut red tape and we've tried it before with uh, num numerous different schemes and it never really worked because uh, we all know that bureaucracy is always growing. So I had a wonderful idea and I want to share it with you now. <laughs> so the idea is uh, we all think that an emissions trading scheme, in theory at least, can work to cut pollution. Now, what is bureaucracy but pollution? Right? So we issue red tape certificates to polluters. <laughs> the polluters are, of course, ministries and departments and bureaucracies. And so what we do, we just measure how much pollution there is, how much red tape there is in the economy. And then afterwards, we issue red tape certificates. But we only issue 90% of the current level. And then we let these government uh, bureaucrats trade with each other and <laughs> drive down pollution. I think it's a wonderful idea, and I think our left-wing colleagues should support it. <laughs> do you? <laughs> Look, well, I, I do wonder whether the one-in-one-out rule on regulation that has been introduced by the government, ca government is a little bit more simple. Um, also, when not it's all small, it's actually much <laughs> easier to achieve those sorts of outcomes. Also, not all regulation is the same, right? So sometimes regulation, you know, yes, it can be a blunt instrument. Sometimes a blunt instrument is the most efficient one, which is what Malcolm Turnbull recognised when he decided just ban incandescent light bulbs instead of having a complicated market trading system in phasing <laughs> out incandescent <laughs> light bulbs. David? Look, I broadly support the idea of reducing red tape. I, you know, it depends in what form, though. I'd, I'd point Oliver to a paper that, that looks at um, uh, 
the time and money it takes to start a business in a country, which is a reasonably good measure of, of red tape. And Australia performs very well. You know, try, try and start a business in, in Italy or Greece or some of these places. So, you know, broadly, keen to see red tape come down. I'm interested in something Tim said, though, about competitive federalism. And I wonder whether the, the kind of logical extension of it is that you have kind of six different sets of building standards across the, the states and territories, or eight yeah. you know, across the states Why and not? territories. But surely, I mean, that is a, that is a duplication of red tape that, that adds a cost on business, that, that lowers productivity in the economy. All the kind of things that you guys normally argue uh, for are impeded by the idea that we go back to the you know, there's eight or nine different sets of regulations for every single sector. First, I just want to say on Oliver's point, I'm while I'm very concerned about red tape, what I'd like to see is the equivalent set up for green tape. So maybe as part of the trade-off of now having uh, a carbon tax, we could introduce a green tape emissions trading, a green tape trading scheme uh, where we could progressively reduce that as a consequence. And with regard to your point, yes, there is duplication, but that is about maximising choice. Uh, and that, how else are you going to get policy innovation? It's not actually a desirable outcome. Why does everybody think that a monopoly is bad when it's in the private sector, but when it's in the government, it's fine? It basically, government is a monopoly. And if you actually create one system and where everything is harmonised into one standard, you actually have a monopoly when we'd be much better off energising the power of competition to get different outcomes and see which ones work and which ones do not. absolutely reduces the red tape problem that you're talking about. Uh, not necessarily. In fact, you can get substantially worse outcomes when it's at a national level because the laws are designed further away from those who, effect, uh, who are affected by it. If you're, a, if you're a builder who works across the country, do you really want to have to comply to eight, nine different sets of... Do you OHS want to? Yes. No, but, but it's a situation. Mary? Look, look, no, I'm, no, no, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. But when you're actually comparing that, think of Switzerland. Switzerland is 7.5 million people in 26 different cantons. It's extremely small scale. They've got 20... <laughs> six cantons, they've got 2,900 independent communities, and yet they collect taxes at, in, in each of these different cantons, in each of these different communities, they have different building regulations and so on, and Switzerland actually works quite well because they've got the competition. If you don't like it in St. Gallen, you go to Zurich. Correct. I'm generally in favour of reducing... I'd be happy in St. Gallen. Uh, I could live in St. Gallen. I'd take Zurich. <laughs> um, on the degree of taxation that the... Um, Social Democrats like, which seems to go to about 50% of GDP, and the degree of taxation that the uh, classical liberals like, which would seem to be to come down to about 25% of GDP. Can, is there a, a principle that both sides might have on this question? Like I mean, I don't have. I don't look. When it comes down to it, I don't have a number about uh, the rate of. Uh, government involvement. I'm always looking for avenues to try and decrease it so that we could probably get even below 25% uh, because that still sounds to me uh, like a lot. What we need to do is reform our taxation system um, in a way that makes sure that we do limit both the growth but, of course, get a more desirable economic outcome. But I don't have a magic number. Yeah, I'd agree with Tim that I don't have a magic number, but I, I think where I differ is that while I don't think uh, more is better, in every instance, I certainly don't think less is better. I think you run the risk of denuding your kind of pool of public goods and services, um, and I think we're locked into a public debate where less is better, and that's that's what we're really arguing against. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd agree with that. And I think that um, rather than saying that there was a magic number, you should have taxation that's sufficient to do what it is that you need government to do, and that is based on, you know, some classic... Uh, you know, textbook economics on market failure and public good economics and so on, um, and it's also based on society's decision about how many problems they want to solve collectively and how many problems they want to deal with by themselves, and that's a, a values and a social decision. I'd argue that Australia's values are in line with a relatively higher taxation rate than the average of the OECD based on that question, um, and yet we have a, a much lower taxation rate. I also don't believe in magic and numbers. Um, <laughs> I think we can try to drive it down to your 25% uh, and we can look further if you want. But I think for the time being, um, I think you, I know what you're alluding to. You're probably alluding to that idea of a uh, anarcho-capitalist society. I think we're quite far away from that. So let's see how we go on the way. <laughs> Get to the classical okay. liberal part first. Over here. Thank you, Parnell. I was going to ask Miriam Lyons how many degrees she thought the banning of incandescent lights was going to lower the temperatures. <laughs> of the globe. However, I would like to ask the progressives here. The definition of libertarian, I've, uh, libertarianism I've heard that I like the best was they want to take power and then leave people alone. And I'd like to ask the 
progressives in the audience here, the progressives on the panel here, what it is that they distrust about individuals and their ability to make choices about their own lives, how they do things, how they drink, how they gamble, how they eat, and all sorts of things, and why they think people in the government are more qualified than them to make decisions about how they live their own lives. Can I just say I'm not in favour of paternalism in government policy as a general rule, uh, and, and I, I actually think that you know this situation when we've got you know over a hundred thousand, I think it's almost up to two hundred thousand problem gamblers. It's some ridiculous number, right? Um, ninety thousand. Ninety thousand. Sorry, getting my numbers wrong. Poor head, head for stats. Um, so, we question those numbers that, so that's if it's ninety thousand or less, whatever. It's a significant number. Um, Creating a system where you just have to have a pre-commitment thing, which is, you know, something that a lot of us use, mandatory pre-commitment, but you still get to choose your number, right? Um, you know, a lot of us do that to ourselves when we, you know, buy gym memberships in a hope of bribing ourselves to go to the gym or, you know, you stick your alarm clock on the other side of the room because you know that you're more rational when you go to bed at night than when you wake up sleeping in the morning. You know, it's, it's, it's not such a particularly onerous thing, right? I'm, I'm very against other forms of government paternalism, like the compulsory income management, for example, which I think shows absolutely no respect for people's ability to manage their own lives. Um, that's a very different situation from saying, you know, how should we as a society um, mix up individual user pays uh, ways of dealing, you know, paying for services and collective ways of paying for services. And, uh, you know, in that context, I think we really should let, you know, governments do what they do best, markets do what they be do best, the community sector do what it does best and kind of keep on monitoring that and see, see what belongs in what sector. Okay. Just, 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 just very briefly, um, I'm not at all against individual freedom, um, but I think it's got to be balanced with some other things. I think the French have a pretty good um, approach. I know that won't be entirely popular, but liberté, fraternité, égalité, you know, suggests that there's a set of values that must kind of coalesce and, and, and there's some trade-offs there to make. Um, on the making decisions point, um, we're not perfectly rational actors. Um, people can be predictably irrational in, in many ways. You know, we Ministers too. <laughs> ministers, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Ministers too, we, you know, and, and I don't think... Certainly, I'm not making an argument that, that governments are perfect, omniscient, all-knowing, all-seeing. Um, but there are people in our society, undoubtedly, who are vulnerable and who, who, placed in that gaming room with the lights down, will gamble away their paycheck. Now, do we want to try and help those people in the least coercive way possible, which I think mandatory pre-commitment, um, you know, uh, is? Or do we want to say, you know, we're happy because we, we stick very tightly to this value of liberty above all else to let those people, you know, frankly suffer. Okay, we've got a question at the end of that row and then one from you, Michael. Hi, somebody earlier on said that, um, that the free market has been the dominant ideology in the last 50 years, say. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, at the end of the 80s, um, I guess no rational sort of person would have looked at the experiment of communism and socialism and said, well, that totally worked. You know, I think we're at a stage now after the GFC where there has been evidence to say that the free market as an ideology, you know, hasn't worked that well. Um, although I know that the argument is is that, you know, other factors are in play, but at the same time other factors were in play at the end of communism as well. At what stage do free market tiers, or whatever we call them now, um, what, at what stage would you accept that the free market as an ideology is flawed? Yeah, go for it. First of all, <clears throat> I don't think that in the 1980s uh, it would have been difficult to find people who didn't believe in communism. You look at uh, Samuelson's economics, uh, the 1987 edition, and he says that uh, the Soviet Union is a good example of how planned economy can still work. So you still found that. Now on your real question, I think um, when we're looking at the market crisis, I mean, you're looking at the, the core of the crisis now, the core is Europe, and the core problem in Europe is that you have governments that are over-indebted because they spend too much. That's got nothing to do with the free market. When the free market now decides, or capital markets decide, that they don't want to lend to these over-indebted governments anymore, that's not a crisis of capitalism, that's a crisis of social democracy. Because these the governments have... The US is in the same position with hang on, debt, hang on, hang you wouldn't argue it hang is on, a social democracy. <laughs> okay, well, then let's talk about the US. I think it is a disaster that uh, you now have a position where you try to... Uh, Inflate your way. Well, no, hey, 
I think the, the real crisis is that we're trying to get away from uh, the uh, connection between risk and liability. If you are taking risk, if you are happy to make a killing in markets, that's all fine. But you shouldn't really uh, go to your government afterwards and say, uh, can you please bail me out if things go pear-shaped. I think we really have to come back to fundamental free market rules for engagement in markets. And that is, if you're taking a risk, you have to stick to it, whether that investment fails or succeeds. I think we are not experiencing a cri crisis of free market capitalism. We're actually seeing more of that kind of um, government meddling with um, the free market process, because I think we should actually let this crisis run its course in America, let a few financial institutions go bankrupt. And in that sense, I'm completely with the Occupy movement, because <laughs> I think uh, when they uh, protest against governments continually bailing out uh, broke financial institutions that risk too much, I'm with them. I think we have to restore capitalism. We should let this crisis run its course. I was just going to, yeah. I have extremely little to add to that because I think it's absolutely spot on. I mean, the simple reality is part of capitalism is actually allowing things to fail. And we seem to have lost this. And actually, it's a very big market signal sent. It isn't market failure. It's a market signal when things go pear-shaped. Okay, we've got you two agreeing with one another. What about something from the... Well, look, uh, I agree with large parts of what, what Oliver said. You know, clearly now we're looking in Europe at, at governments that have borrowed too much, at welfare states that are too big and they're paying the price. But there are some other factors here too. Um, Ireland is in the situation because it bailed out its banks. It didn't let its banks fail. That's why Ireland um, is, is heavily indebted. And the other, the other point, going back to my 2008 thing earlier, is that going back to 2008 earlier, is that w we had a, effectively an invisible derivatives market where a whole set of organisations bet on the likelihood of other organisations failing without any regulation and, and where regulation was suggested, it was heavily resisted. And when Lehman Brothers and then ARG collapsed, you had a, effectively a complete liquidity squeeze in, in the global financial system because of this resistance to regulate uh, derivatives, to, 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 to kind of fight against over-the-counter derivatives. This was the trigger that kind of led us down the track. I know, I know what Tim's point is, and it's that the US government said that um, you should allow anyone to take a home loan irrespective of their capacity to pay for it, and that's, that's a valid point. It was, it was actually it, a, that, a market success, not a market failure, they, when they said we the shouldn't loan problem, money to these people. Had that been the only problem, you would have had a housing bubble deflate in the US, and that would have had some problems and all the rest of it, but it would have been not unmanageable. In the same way, the reason Greece is not allowed to default today is because the French banks don't want to go bust. And the French banks put immense pressure on the French government to say, do not call this a default. And none of us know what bets are on the table out there about a Greek default and therefore what the flow-on effect is because it's unregulated. And isn't the whole euro crisis just a perfect example of what happens when you let the state run affairs? Okay, Mary, Look, I, I would argue that there's two different lessons that we should learn um, here. Uh, from the GFC, we should learn that, yes, we need to have... Um, uh, we need to be really aware of moral hazard, this implicit assumption that banks that are too big to fail or other financial institutions that are too big to fail will be bailed out. You know, that creates an incentive for very irresponsible decisions. So... Uh, I would argue that it means that we need something like what Bernie Fraser and many others have been arguing for, which is you have a system where you have your sort of um, traditional banks which, you know, have quite strong regulations, that they have, you know, strong regulations around sufficient capital reserves um, and that they are subject to, you know, the... the you know, implicit things like the deposit guarantee or explicit things like the deposit guarantee. Uh, and then you have the rest of the financial sector and you just say, you know, look, just, you know, cut sick, do whatever little financial innovations that you like, but we're not going to bail you out if you go bust. I, I think that would be a better situation than what we have now. And if we'd had that situation, it probably would have prevented uh, uh, the excessive debts that um, the UK and the US incurred in bailing out their banking system. So they would be a lot less broke than they are now. There is a different situation around um, the ongoing structural deficits in some of the EU countries. Some of those, as David correctly pointed out earlier, is an unwillingness to max their spending with taxation. So you could just as easily argue that it's a crisis of unwillingness to tax as a crisis of willingness <laughs> no, to spend. <laughs> uh, uh, but the other situation... It there is that you do have um, uh, countries that adopt, you know, that don't adopt the flip side of Keynesianism. So, you know, classic Keynesianism means that you spend up in da downturns, but you do run surpluses uh, in boom times. That's d that's different from a situation of actually being w willing to borrow to invest in productive <coughs> investments like infrastructure. Um, uh, the other thing that those countries need to deal with is obviously the global imbalance where, you know, you've got a structural situation where they've just, you know, said, OK, well, you know, we'll just 
consume a lot um, and will prop up consumer spending in order to deal with the fact that um, our economy's, you know, kind of a little bit structurally broke because we're not really making much that we can export anymore. Um, and I think a lot of countries have really struggled to face up for that. They've been propping up that up with various types of incentives to prop up consumer spending, uh, as is Australia for that matter, you know, with yeah, our... we shouldn't. No, and we shouldn't do <laughs> that. Right. So they need to find another way of actually putting their own economies in a stronger well, position. But how about just I letting know. the market send the signal that if there is a downturn and people don't have consumer spending, there is a reduction in consumer spending? That's a pretty simple this outcome to This is a really today. interesting debate. You guys have had it lots before. I am going to impose another little rule because we've got lots of interesting people asking questions here, and that is fairly single-barrel answers from the panel <laughs> as well. Okay, Michael. Yeah, um, all four of your organisations are organisations that go out and commission research and seek evidence to justify um, a public policy position. And I guess in that sense, um, all of you are probably doing more than what uh, the governments in Australia are doing, which is um, generating pro policy by press release in, in response to um, media stories. Um, so I guess, in a way, all of you are failures because um, your, your approach towards policy making isn't being taken up by um, governments or oppositions. So um, how, how, would each of you, how, how would each of you go about addressing that failure and how can we um, uh, bridge the disconnect between um, sound evidence-based policy making and what goes on in public debate in Australia at the moment, which is policy by knee-jerk or press release or by mob lynching or whatever else? Well, you have to actually start with a government that believed in something. Uh, and if you got that, then you might be able to start to articulate and, and get uh, policy around, built around that, uh, that value set, which actually could make them uh, less responsive um, at the end of the day. That's the core problem with this government. I mean, yes, we're all far more efficient than the bureaucracy. I, I'll uh, accept that even on behalf of uh, the CPD and per capita as well as the CIS. Uh, perhaps the solution is that really we should just abolish most of these government departments and leave the policy making up to us. Okay. <laughs> I must say that I've seen quite a few of my proposals uh, being implemented now. Um, part of the uh, work on housing that I did in the UK um, is now being undertaken by the Cameron government. Uh, the um, government in Britain now has a new um, advisory body for fiscal policy that was also one of our initiatives. Even my red tape trading scheme is now being trialed in a shire here. So. <laughs> Uh, occasionally it happens. Now the thing I, I, I believe with think tanks is um, in a way we are completely unnecessary. Um, we are necessary because there are so many academic economists in Australia that if they did their jobs properly we wouldn't be needed. And we would be completely unnecessary too if the government only read the reports from the Productivity Commission. But of course governments do, don't do that and academic economists don't publish in newspapers because uh, they don't get anything out of that. And so probably we are still needed. But there is also, sorry, I don't want to take away, there is a quick point, which is that ideas take a long time to germinate and actually grow, and so the role of think tanks is often to uh, put ideas out there, but you may not see the connection with how it influences public policy for a period of time, so it's quite hard to judge. I was going to put that same point in, in slightly different phrasing. Think tanker is a long game. Uh, really, you're, you're looking to influence events over, you know, decades-long cycles, and one of the ways you do it is the way Tim alluded to, which is to kind of see the ideas and hope that they kind of, that they gradually um, multiply and, and find their way out, particularly into, you know, future young leaders who are going to think, you know, when my generation's time comes, this is a set of thinking that I've thought about and I really like. Um, so, you know, like Oliver, I've had particular, you know, policy proposals adopted in parts and that's, that's gratifying in the short term. Um, but what you're talking about is, is the difference between the immediacy of the political cycle and, and think tankery, which is a kind of a, a long game. Alongside that, think tanks are having to adapt to this kind of much shorter cycle. So, you know, all of us have had to think about Twitter in the last two years and work out, well, how do you take some complex ideas and shrink them down to 140 characters and spit them out that way? <laughs> so, you know, you know I, I think we're evolving as well. We're trying to evolve. There are some exceptions to that rule of, you know, not having evidence-based uh, policy positions get up. You know, there are some things that came out of, say, the Henry Review or various Productivity Commission inquiries that have got up and been implemented as policy. But I do agree that that is a trend. Um, and I think that the only way of combating that trend is a cultural shift in both major parties. Uh, 
which is, and I think the libertarians in the room will probably be happy with this idea, actually respecting that individual citizens can grapple with complex policy ideas and arguments if governments give them a chance to do so. You know, just treat them with a bit of respect. You know, stop assuming that you have to cater to the lowest common denominator of vo voters or, you know, craft your policy by focus group and press release, you know, and actually be willing to come out and say, these are the assumptions that we're basing our policies on. These are the principles. We think this is a good idea. We know that it's going to involve some sacrifices in the short term. We think it's worthwhile because of this, rather than assuming that you can, you know, give people everything and it'll cost them nothing. Tim, um you mentioned earlier tonight that you thought that the Occupy movement was a couple of people. Maybe it is. Um, just taking um, the fact that maybe it is actually a couple of people, mm -hmm. how do you reconcile that and their beliefs with the half million people that actually, actually protested against the Iraq war across the Har Bridge? How do you sort of see that role of people and their voice in, 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 a, in a democracy? Well, I don't really have a reconciliation. They're more than entitled to have their voice and to speak up. That's why I support democracy. Um, they, they are a relatively small group of people. That doesn't mean you know, they don't have their, their rights or capacity to exercise that. Um, where they went wrong was rather than protesting, they occupied, and occupied is a very different concept to protest. You can't do anything in the name of protest. Uh, but you can, uh, there are limits to the extent which you can exercise uh, that right. Because there are competing rights with it as well. Do we want to explore that one further or can we move to the next one? Uh, I'm, I'm happy moving on. Yep. yep. I'd like to um, come back to a concept that we mentioned earlier this evening, which is equality of opportunity. And I'd like to hone in particularly on education. When I finished school, which is 15 years ago, um, having gone to a state school with a nurse and a car dealer as parents and went on to go to university and do law, um, opportunity meant the ability to get into that sort of course, to work bloody hard and get a good job and then work your way up the ladder. Having children now going through primary school, opportunity or a quality of opportunity seems to focus on trying to drag up um, the lower echelons to make them average rather than trying to promote excellence. How do we see that focus on equality of opportunity um, bringing forward in our economy the next generation of people who are prepared to genuinely work hard rather than pandering to the lazy um, and uh, non, you know, the sort of work shy? So I, I guess I'd react uh, to kids who are lazy and work shy. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, without question, there are, there are schools and households that are disadvantaged in which kids find it very difficult for a whole plethora of reasons to succeed in the way that you have. Um, now, it's not impossible and, and some very strong individuals manage to do it, but I think to characterise efforts to lift the lowest performing schools up as pandering to work shy and lazy is, is a bridge too far. I don't think that you can say that you have a quality of opportunity in a society where the quality of primary school or secondary school education is dependent on their parents' income. You know, like, I just don't think that you can say that you've got a quality of opportunity where you only get a good education if you're a member of the Lucky Sperm Club. <laughs> but just picking on that point, though, there, there is a serious issue about trying to lift the average artificially um, to be, uh, you know, more culturally sensitive or, or, or be a much more feel-good policy. In the end, people need to know if they're bad at something. Failure is part of life. Making mistakes is part of life. And the, the appropriate response to that is people should learn from it and grow. And by suffocating people and protecting them from that reality, you are doing extreme harm to that individual because they are not learning. And I know, particularly in the case, uh, I was in an organisation many years ago and we had a staff member who was crap. And I kept saying, fire that individual. Fire, 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 fire. Because we are depriving them of, one, the knowledge that they need to learn to get better. But secondly, we're, de we're t stealing their time. We're stealing time. They're never going to get promoted. We're not going to help them. Um, and they're not getting the message that they actually need to improve their position. And once that person did eventually leave, they got better. 
They went and re-educated themselves. They went to another workplace and they found they got fired from there as well. They got the message. I, I, I'm really not sure how you equate, you know, funding and designing an education system so that it gives the kids the kind of education that they need with... I know, what would be equivalent of that in the education system? Massaging their test results so that they weren't told that they'd failed the I, test? Yeah, I mean, sorry, I don't think anybody my, who is my, reasonable my would partner, be arguing my for that. Hang on. My partner is a school teacher. And he's explicitly told to increase the overall average for the results for some kids. That's what happens. Well, it's I've a disaster. I've certainly heard of situations where test results have been massaged, where there's performance pay for teachers in the I US. I also remember the case uh, in Britain a few years results. ago where primary school children were not even allowed to fail anymore. Yeah. Teachers were told to tell them that it was just some kind of deferred success. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, just it happens at the other end of the education spectrum too. Kind of at the Ivy League schools in the US, grade inflation is so rampant now that everyone gets a GPA of 3.6. And just a little consumer awareness point: um, a lot of the one of the studies that has just been repeated recently um, of expensive private schools is that you tend to get much higher HSE results, but they actually tend to perform, perform worse in their first year of tertiary education. So, just a little consumer awareness point. By the way, student. <laughs> Thank you, Parnell. Um, look, I'm very pleased that you're all in favour of evidence-based um, policy uh, advice. And, OK, I will tell you the evidence on refugees. Refugees do extremely badly in the Australian labour market. They have done extremely badly. Your boss is wrong. They have done extremely badly in the Australian labour market for a very long time. There was a, a government report released on Good Friday deliberately on Good Friday, which shows that 95% of Afghan refugees, five years after they've arrived, are totally dependent on welfare. Okay? Now, you still might be in favour of a refugee program, presumably a limited one. It is a social program. It's all very well you saying chipper things about them being self-selected and being gung-ho. The evidence... Well, the evidence is not... In, I mean, I'm asking Miriam and... Um, well, to defend Don't. your position, because you're wrong. And if you're based on evidence, c come up with the evidence. Without, without, without conceding the evidential point, because I don't know the data you're referring to, but I would say, would we have a different outcome if we didn't lock these people up for two years? I have, I have, uh, can I, can I, I have seen the report, actually, and I think, yes, you're right. Um, the report makes some interesting points. First, for example, um, yes, 95% of all refugees after five years are still unemployed. But it also shows, for example, and that's, again, evidence-based, if you put these refugees into rural communities, they tend to do better than if you put them in the cities because here they find the support networks, they find their ethnic communities, and they disappear immediately. Whereas if you put them in rural communities, they will probably not find too many ethnic people and they have to integrate. And that tells you something about evidence because refugees integrate extremely well when they enter the labor market, when they work, when they don't rely on some support networks, when they don't rely on welfare state measures. I think that's the evidence that we get from refugees, not just from Australia, but from European countries as well, where you give refugees a role in society, where you let them integrate into the labor market, where you make sure they learn the language of the country, you get much, much better results. And that's what we should do. So I'm in favor of accepting refugees, but when they arrive, we have a responsibility to make sure that they integrate as well. We have to actually make sure that they don't see the welfare state as a permanent safety and that's a responsibility to them as well, yes, as much course. as it is to the rest of us. It's reciprocal. So uh, there's lots and lots of really smart ideas being shared within your think tanks and uh, you're vaguely loosely politically affiliated, but why are the parties themselves not full of ideas as clever as the ones you're talking about tonight? We are not affiliated. We, no, 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 sorry. No, um, <laughs> we are not affiliated. We're talking to everybody who wants to listen to us, and that's fine. And if you're asking me why politicians uh, don't listen to ideas coming out of our four brilliant institutions, well, the problem is I think the political process is now driven by something else. It's not driven by ideas. It's driven by short-termism. It's driven by focus groups, and it's driven by opinion polls. And I actually think, and we discussed this yesterday on the radio, I think even lefties now are now yearning back for the times of John Howard because you may have... <laughs> You may have disagreed with him. You may not have liked the guy, but I, I 
I guarantee you, you could have woken him up at 3 a.m. and asked him any question about domestic or international affairs, and he would have told you precisely where he stood. Nowadays, you wake up Julia Gillard or Tony Abbott, for that matter, and I think they will first have to consult with their advisors and see the latest polling results. And I think that's a major problem. We need to have politicians who really know what they are up for. And I think... Leading it back to the whole question of whether we should be ideological or whether we should just be, uh, you know, evidence-based, I think in the end you need both. Of course, you shouldn't be blind to evidence, but if you're blind to evidence, you can't make good policies, and you will just just be a pure ideolog ideologue. But if you're completely without any ideas, and if you really don't know um, what you are all up for and what you believe in then everything is just uh, empty pragmatism driven by the latest opinion polls and uh, perhaps determined by the last person you just talked to. I think we need both. We need empiricism, we need good evidence, but we also need ideologies. I'm a defender of ideology because I think they are vital. I think what Australia needs is not less ideology, but more. And I would like to see it on both sides. I would like to have really vigorous debates, both sides battling it out, let them be pure ideologues, but at least you know what they are up for and what they stand for. That's what we need. And I think we have had enough of these bland politicians who can't even tell you whether they are going to believe in the same idea that they believed in the morning at 6 p.m. <laughs> Yeah, we've definitely got a, a, a terrible situation of the leaders on both sides of the major parties being quite happy to hold six incompatible policy positions before breakfast. I, I, I do think that John Howard held some, you know, ideologically incompatible pos policy positions as well, but I, it was much less extreme than it is now. Um, in terms of where the parties are, we're, we're not party aligned either, and I, you've got to assume that there's some reason that all of us are in think tanks rather than going into politics, and a lot of the people that I know just wouldn't join a political party, you know, at all, because it doesn't look like a fun or effective way of trying to make change at the moment. There's, there's something wrong with the parties and the culture of the parties when that's the case, right? I, I don't like to idealise the old days, but people tell me that there used to be more room within the parties for people who weren't just playing the factional games and were the kind of designated ideas people within the parties, you know? It's like, okay, you, are, you, you be over there, you know, keep your hands clean, you be the ideas people, and, you know, and, and there just doesn't seem to be much room in, in the major parties for those kind of people anymore. Yeah, I, I was... We're not politically affiliated. We have lots of people who work for us who are members of a political party and that's their right. Uh, and uh, being from the centre-right perspective, we generally get to be seen to be more associated with one political party than the other. The other thing is po political parties are often about, well, largely about compromise. Uh, and one of the things about think tanks is that they are not really about compromise. They're normally out there advocating for a more perfect world in their world view. But and that... The, 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 well, it. yeah, in one sense, yes. Whereas once you get a whole bunch of people who share common values, um, but not necessarily the same policy, uh, draw the same policy outcomes from those values, you get compromise and that's why you get these wishy-washy policies that don't uh, stand up often to uh, sort of stand up to a real test of substance. Politics in Australia has become ideas free, or, or maybe more accurately, ideology free. And it, it has to do with the professionalisation of politics, I reckon, and the skills that are required to succeed kind of up that tree are very different to the kind of skills that, that we try to apply in our, in our day jobs here. Um, you know, I, I've heard people refer to those who engage in ideas who are in, active in the political system as ideas wankers. You know, what's the point of that? And, you know, this professionalisation whereby um, it's all about trying to work out what the median voter in the most marginal seat thinks and then replaying that idea back to them ad nauseum is the way to do politics. Now, that's probably something of a generalisation, but it's not far off being what happens throughout Australia's kind of political systems, federal, state, on both sides of politics over the last five, 10, 15 years, perhaps. And the Gillard government's a pretty good example that that, just, that doesn't work as well, politically. And, and it's bad for politics and it's bad for democracy. Even people who sit in focus groups don't want governments who only listen to people in focus groups. <laughs> Look, I Is that think focus that group? Thank our panel, please. Oliver Hartbush, Miriam Lyons, Tim Wilson and David Hetherington, who've been fantastic. This is Big Ideas from the ABC.